Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to this session. I am Tamsil Shams, currently working as Senior Engineer in Samsung Semiconductor India. Today I'll be talking about PWM subsystem and its usage in embedded devices. We will look how the PWM subsystem is present in the Linux kernel and how it is used in different embedded devices. Let's get started. This is the agenda for today. First, we will see what is PWM, how does it works. Then we will get an overview of PWM subsystem in the Linux kernel. Then we will see that uh, PWM driver implementation in the Linux kernel. Then we will see the two ways of driver implementation. One of them is the generic uh, PWM framework and the other one is legacy PWM driver framework. Legacy PWM driver framework we will discuss based on the Samsung PWM driver file. After that, we will see how to use the PWM subsystem with the SysFS interface. That is uh, how to use the PWM subsystem from the user space. And then at the last, we will see the uh, different use cases of PWM in details. Okay, uh, let's start our presentation. PWM stands for Pulse with Modulator. And uh, it works on the principle of modulating the pulse width. Uh, that is uh, some method of changing how long the square waves remains on. And all, it's also a technique of delivering partial power to the load. And it's done via the digital means. So basically we uh, control the analog devices that how much uh, power needs to be uh, given to that. And it, we, do, uh, we do it via the digital means. Uh, it can also operate like a switch, like since there is continuous on and off in the PWM signals, as we can see by the waves, then so it also acts like a switch in many of the control circuits. So based on whatever the principles of the techniques PWM uses, it has found its use in the LED bulbs, in the LCD backlights, in the vibrators in cell phones, in the fan coolers, in the inverters, in the motors, in the robotics industry and etc. We'll see these use cases in details afterwards. So before moving on to the PWM subsystem, we need to look at few of the keywords of uh, PWM signals. One of them is modulating frequency. So modulating frequency is the ratio at which the uh, on and off is switched in the PWM signal. So it affects the average uh, power being uh, transferred to the load. And also uh, it uh, like uh, if we uh, have some specific use case or we have some usage according to which we want to set up a modulating frequency, we can do the same. Then the next topic is duty cycling. So duty cycle is the ratio of total active time by the total time period of the PWM signal. So how much time the wave remains on that's time period and uh, it's by to total time period of on plus time period of off. And it is represented in percentage. It affects the average power being transferred to the load. And based on our use case, we can adjust our duty cycle. As you can see in this diagram, uh, uh, there is a wave which has its uh, time it remain on and the time till which it remains off. So the time till it remains on is T on and the time till it remains off is T off. And the formula for duty cycle is T on by T on plus T off. So you can see that here the since T on is slightly bigger than T off, the duty cycle will be more than 50%. And also you can see as uh, there are three different uh, pulse with uh, the one is for 50% duty cycle, we can see that T on is equal to T off in those. When the, the duty cycle percentage is greater than 50%, that is around 75%, it is the T on is greater than the T off. And when the duty cycle is less than 50%, to be specific, when it is 25%, we can see T on is less than T off. Also, we can see like when the duty cycle value changes, how the, uh, the, the, the power which is being supplied to the load differs as by the brightness of the bulb. If you see in the 10% duty cycle, the uh, bulb is very dim. Uh, for 40% duty cycle, there is a slight brightness in the bulb. Then for 80% duty cycle, the brightness of bulb is very much. So this was how the duty cycle affects the PWM signal. So these are some of the use cases of PWM. As I said earlier, it's used in the fans, it's used in the LED bulbs, 
is also used in the telecommunication industry. It's used in robots and it's used in sound amplification. So we will uh, see for all of these use cases in details uh, later in the slides. Now I've just given an overview of those. Yeah, so this is the new topic. It's a PWM subsystem in kernel. Here we will see the how the PWM subsystem is implemented in the Linux kernel, the different types of APIs in the subsystem and how to identify the PWM. That is to, before doing device driver binding, how do we identify the PWM which helps us to uh, do the driver device driver binding. So first type of APIs is in kernel APIs. Uh, in kernel APIs are the PWM kernel driver APIs. So these APIs are the basically the main APIs which the PWM devices are using to be functional. Uh, these are present in the core file of PWM that is core.c in the driver's PWM directory. And also there are many platform specific driver files for PWM. So th all those IPs, APIs in those uh, files are uh, uh, having in kernel APIs only. One of those example is Samsung PWM driver file. Uh, which is pwm samsung.c it is also present in the drivers pwm directory we will see this in kernel apis in details in the uh, pwm driver implementation section then the next type of apis are user space apis uh, these are the apis which uh, helps us to use the pwm device from user space uh, these are present as csfs interface in the linux kernel uh, the file for this is csfs.c in the drivers pwm directory and also when the kernel is booted this uh, user space api's commands are exposed at sys class pwm uh, directory we will see this in details in the uh, using of pwm subsystem with csfs interface section okay so now before moving to the driver implementation part we need to uh, look, take a look at a small topic called identifying pwm basically this topic is related to uh, how do we do the device driver binding of PWM devices in doing the probe? So there are two ways of doing so. Uh, the legacy approach of doing so is uh, using the unique ID, which refers to the PWM device. And we try to match this unique ID uh, present within the board files or the DT files. And we uh, do the device driver binding using that. The another approach to do is like whichever is what this current approach is being used is to that the driver files contain some kind of static mapping and this helps us to uh, match the pwm device and driver and helps us to have the device driver binding so no now we will see the pwm driver implementation how the driver implementation is there in the linux kernel so again there are two ways to implement pwm driver one is the uh, via the legacy approach in this the APIs in the files are very uh, platform specific or board or consumer specific. Uh, those have their own APIs. Uh, uh, like uh, for Samsung PWM driver, you can see it has PWM Samsung request, PWM Samsung con config. So these uh, do a sim uh, same kind of uh, use, one only one kind of use, and we cannot have multifunctionality in those APIs. But there is another form of driver implementation, which is generic PWM framework. It gives us the flexibility to uh, use PWM device uh, in multiple use cases. Uh, the driver which is implemented for our use, we can in those APIs, we can use these APIs uh, by we can call these APIs and have our operation done. The few examples are PWM request, PWM config, then there is PWM chip add, then there is PWM chip remove, and there are some generic structure also. Similar to this, there are APIs and uh, structures in the platform specific uh, APIs also. We will uh, platform specific files also. Sorry, we can we will see both in the details. This generic PWM framework first we will see, then we will see the legacy driver implementation. But before that, we will see how why this generic PWM framework is used before these uh, platform specific uh, files nowadays. So there are basically uh, two uh, reasons why to use that. One is to provide flexibility. So as I said, uh, flexibility uh, is when that uh, uh, PWM device is kind of discrete device and uh, it has no fixed purpose. It has multi-purpose. It can be used in different way. So it is directly up to the designer, board designer, how he wants to use the PWM device. So when we have three to four different types of use cases in our for PWM device, we 
can use the generic PWM APIs that it gives us the flexibility to use it in different ways. But in legacy approach, we don't have that flexibility and we can use it only a single way. Then there another reason of it is locking issue. So as I can say that the mutex locking is there for request and free functions in the platform specific files. But for enable disable config, this mutex is not enabled in the platform specific driver files or the legacy approach. So it doesn't help us to have multiple PWM device to be using at, as there can be a deadlock or some kind of locking issue because one device may be using it, but at the same time, another device want to use that same API. So in this, to uh, avoid this issue, the generic PWM framework comes and which enables us to have multiple PWM device to be used in the same board. So we have seen the two different ways in basics, how to do driver implementation. We have seen how, uh, why this generic PWM framework is used before legacy uh, driver implementation nowadays. Now we will see the generic PWM framework in details. It's uh, different APIs, uh, how to use those APIs and then the different generic structures of PWM in the generic framework. Then the like, so, so the first thing we do for PWM device after probe is we request for the PWM device. So before configuration of PWM device or for use of PWM device, we need to request for PWM device. So the first, uh, there are a few APIs for requesting. Uh, those are PWM request, PWM get, off PWM get. PWM request was used earlier, but nowadays it is deprecated. So it is not used nowadays. Now the next API is PWM get. So this PWM get uh, does the request of PWM device via lookup. Uh, so by lookup, I meant that first it will uh, go and look up into the DT table for the, the DT file for the node. And if it doesn't get it there, then it will go to the file, which is uh, uh, given us to given to us by the board files, the tables, which is given to us by the board files. So the difference here between PWM request and PWM get is that only that in PWM request, we only go and request look up into the DT file, but in PWM get, we also go and check into the tables, which is provided by the board files. That is the difference. And that's why PWM get is nowadays used. Now there's another API called off PWM get. So off PWM get helps us to do the same thing with uh, PWM get. It does the lookup in both the uh, DT file as well as the table in the board file, but it does it via the PWM framework. Uh, so this PWM get uses a very generic kernel framework of lookup, but this off PWM uses the PWM framework. Uh, the, by PWM framework, I meant the using the PWMS property. So we mentioned some PWMS property in the node, which has its own P handle and index value. So based on those values and the uh, uh, configurations we provide, we do this lookup via off PWM get. Then once we have the PWM device, uh, then we can configure it as per our need, then we can use it, we can get our output. And once the use is done and the driver detachment is done, we can free the PWM device using PWM free API or PWM put API. So this PWM free API is similar to PWM request was used earlier, but now it is deprecated. Now it is mostly used API is the PWM put APIs. Now again, there are a few other variants of PWM get like uh, based on our use cases or based case on our uh, management of the PWM device, we have few uh, variants of PWM get. One of those variants is DevM PWM get. So it is a resource managed version of PWM get. By resource managed, I mean that if we get the PWM device, if we request for the PWM device and we get that. So when after use the driver detachments happen, so when we are using DevM PWM get, it will automatically release the device after the driver detachment. We don't need to explicitly call the free function like PWM put or PWM free. That's the difference between DevM PWM get and PWM. That's the basic um, meaning of resource managed. Then there is DevM off PWM get. Again, this is the resource managed version of off PWM get API. This function is same and it gives us the resource managed device node. Then there is another API called DevM FW node PWM get. Uh, it returns the resource managed PWM device from the firmware node. So again, this firmware node is the, uh, there is a firmware table present in the DT file or in the uh, board file. So those firmware table have some nodes for different devices. So if you want to get the 
uh, node for the PWM device from the firmware table, we use this API to get the PWM device from firmware node. Moving forward, uh, we will see the different structure now. After that, we will again see few other APIs on, but since there was talk about the PWM device, we will see the structure. So when we request, we get the PWM device. So that PWM device is this struct PWM device. It represents the PWM channel object. Again, there are multiple fields for it. There is label, which mentions the name of the PWM device. Then there is a flags field, which will uh, uh, shows as the flag associated with the PWM device. Then there is HW PWM field, which uh, represents the per chip relative index of the PWM device. Then there is PWM field, it represents the global index of the PWM device. Then there is chip field, which is the uh, variable for PWM chip structure. We will see the structure PWM chip structure next in the presentation. Then there is chip data variable, which stores the private chip data associated with this channel. So uh, since in one chip, there are multiple channels and if a specific channel has some data related to that chip, which is unique to other channels, then those data are uh, uh, stored in this chip data. Then there is arcs variable for struct PWM arcs. Again, this PWM arcs is the PWM argument. We will again look into this in further in the slides. Then there is PWM state structure, which have its two field here. We'll check into what is PWM state. So state is the current applied state or the last applied state. And the last is the last implemented state. So it helps us for debugging. We will check in details about PWM chip, PWM arcs and PWM state. So yeah, first we will check into PWM chip. So this PWM chip represents the PWM controller of the chip. It has its own field like dev, which is the device pointer. Then there is ops field. It represents the different callbacks of the PWM controller, like either we add, remove, config, probe, whatever be the uh, callbacks, which is provided. Then there is a base field, which represents the number of the PWM control. Then there is NPWM. It represents the number of channels supported by this chip. And there are many more fields which uh, we directly don't use in the driver, but it has its internal use in the PWM framework. So yeah, now we will see how to configure PWM state and what are the structures uh, used in those configuration. Uh, there's an API called PWM apply state. It helps in the configuration of PWM. Uh, it helps us to configure the period and data cycle and then control it. It also helps us to control the enable and disable state of the PWM device. Also, it controls the usage of power setting. Again, this PWM apply state is a combination of three different individual uh, APIs called PWM config, uh, PWM enable, and PWM disable. This PWM config is related to the configuration of period and duty cycle or the usage controlation or control of usage power setting. This PWM enable is for uh, uh, control of enable state and this PWM disable is to control the disabled state. Again, we can use this as individual APIs, but if we are using it in the same flow as PWM config, PWM enable, and then PWM disable, it's better to use PWM apply state because it gives us a, a atomic context while using the PWM device. Also, when we go on to get the current uh, applied state, we can get it via PWM get state. So here again, as I said, uh, the structure used here is PWM state. Uh, it represents the state of a particular PWM channel. It has four fields. There is period, which represents the PWM period in nanoseconds. Then there is duty cycle, uh, which represents the PWM duty cycle in nanoseconds. Then there is a polarity field. It represents the PWM polarity. By polarity, I meant it's uh, either normal uh, polarity or inverse polarity. By normal polarity, it means the signal uh, is normal in the inverse polarities mean the signals are inverted on becomes off off becomes on some that kind of thing then there is enabled state which uh, variable which uh, shows us the status of enabled state whether the pwm channel is in enabled or disabled state again uh, there is another api which exposes the pwm arguments uh, this pwm arguments is the stuck pwm arcs uh, it's a reference pwm config to be used uh, by reference PWM config, I can say that the configuration which we do during the initial probe that uh, is stored in the PWM arcs, it also helps us in reconfiguration during resume part. And when we uh, want to retrieve this PWM arguments, we can use this PWM get arcs uh, API to get the PWM argument. 
Now there is uh, one difference between PWM arcs and PWM state. Not one difference. The basic difference is that PWM state represents the current configuration of PWM. Whatever uh, state we have applied last, whatever configuration we have done, that is stored in the PWM state structure. But this PWM arcs uh, uh, stores the initial configuration of the reference configuration of the PWM device, which is initially set. It cannot be changed once it is set during the probe part. Also, when there is one more thing which I forgot in PWM state, it was that uh, this PWM state gives us the last applied software implemented state. Maybe the hardware implemented state may differ from the software implemented state if some error happens during the PWM apply state call. And there is no such uh, uh, APIs in the current framework to get the actual hardware implemented state. I missed that earlier, but sorry for that. Yeah, so that was the generic PWM framework. We saw the different APIs and different structures. Now the same thing we will see in the legacy PWM driver implementation also. This legacy PWM driver implementation will be based on Samsung PWM driver. Yeah, so the Samsung PWM driver file is uh, PWM Samsung.c. It is present in the driver's PWM directory. So now we will see the PWM arguments in uh, Samsung driver file. The first is C Samsung PWM channel. It represents the PWM channels details. Again, there are three fields. One is period NS, it stores the period of PWM signal in nanoseconds. Then there is duty NS, stores the duty time of the uh, PWM nanosecond. Then there is TIN NS, which stores the rate of timer of PWM signals based on the current configuration. It again stores it in nanoseconds. Then there is another structure called Samsung PWM chip. Uh, it represents the data of the PWM chip. There are uh, variables, uh, fields in them. Like uh, there is a field for Samsung PWM chip. The generic uh, API also, the generic structure of PWM chip also has a chip. So there may be some details which is stored in the chip variable and we don't need to again explicitly define it in this uh, structure also. Then there is Samsung PWM variant field. It uh, represents the local hardware variant of PWM. It did, uh, stores a detail about different hardware configuration of PWM. Then there is an inverter mask and disable mask field. Inverter mask stores the current inverter status of each channel. <laughs> disable mask stores the current uh, enable or disable status of each PWM channel. Then there is a base field to store the base uh, address of the PWM device. Then there is a base clock pointer. It stores the pointer for the clock which is running the PWM timer or the PWM device. Then there are two other clock pointers called TCLK0 and TCLK1. These are for the external clocks. If the PWM device supports such clock, there will be some details related to them. Otherwise, it is uh, error pointer. So now uh, we will see different APIs just as like in the generic PWM framework, there are uh, APIs here in legacy framework which does the operation which we do as the generic PWM framework also. So for probe, there is PWM Samsung probe. Then to remove the PWM device, there is an API called PWM Samsung remove. And during the power management for resume, there is a PWM Samsung resume API. Now there was request and free function for uh, in the generic framework. Similar to that, there are request and free function in the legacy implementation also. There is PWM Samsung request and PWM Samsung free respectively for doing uh, request and free of device. Then the more, one of the most important APIs is PWM Samsung config. Uh, this helps us to configure the PWM. Uh, it sets the PWM uh, duty cycle and the period. And this also updates the PWM SFR as per our need in the configuration. So now uh, there is another few other APIs like PWM Samsung enable. It uh, enables or starts the PWM signal. There is PWM Samsung disable, which disable or stops the PWM signal. Uh, to help or to support these APIs, there are a few wrapper functions in the legacy driver implementation. These wrapper functions may be there in the generic framework also. So one of those APIs is PWM Samsung set polarity. It will set the polarity, either be it in the normal state or be it in the inverse state. And also there is another API called PWM Samsung manual update. It uh, helps us to manually update the configuration or SFR of PWM device as per our need or at the end of one of the cycle 
that is the current implementation if we want to support the manual update too. Yeah, so we have till now looked upon uh, the PWM driver implementation in both phase in the generic PWM framework and both in the legacy. So now this uh, diagram represents how the uh, Samsung specific PWM structure are represent, uh, associated with the generic PWM structure. So this Samsung PWM chip is the main uh, structure for Samsung PWM chip. Uh, it is it inherits a, a few data from the Samsung PWM variant structure which represents the local hardware variant. And again, the Samsung PWM chip is associated with the PWM chip. This is the generic PWM chip structure. So it has many of the fields so it can directly use these uh, fields for its use. And this PWM chip has its one to many relationship with the PWM device structure as one chip may have multiple channels. So it has a one to many relationship. And this PWM device, which represents the channel of PWM chips, it generates uh, the state data from the PWM state data from the PWM state structure. So this is the overview of the relation between the uh, platform specific PWM structure and the generic PWM structure between them. Yeah, now so we have uh, uh, seen the working of PWM, then we have seen an overview of the PWM system. There was two kind of APIs, in kernel APIs, user space APIs. Then we check the identification of PWM. How do we do the device driver binding? In the PWM subsystem, we uh, got into the details of in kernel APIs in the PWM driver implementation section. In the PWM driver implementation, we saw there are two types of driver implementation. One was generic PWM framework. We saw that in details. Then the legacy PWM driver implementation also, we saw that in details. We also saw the relation between the different structures of platform specific if uh, files and the generic uh, PWM file. Also, we saw why the generic framework uh, is has an advantage over the legacy approach. Now, the other type of APIs that uh, user space APIs, we will see how those are used from the user space. Uh, that is done by the CFS interface. It's a very simple PWM CFS interface. To be using that, we need to enable the config CFS in the configuration file. Then. <laughs> Once it is enabled and the Linux is booted, uh, that CSFS is exposed at sys class PWM directory. And the PWM chips which are probed are exported as PWM chip N in this directory, sys class PWM. N is the base value as mentioned in the PWM chip structure. So this can be 0, 1, 2 based on the number of PWM chip. So this is how it is represented sys class pwm pwm chip 0 sys class pwm pwm chip 1 then inside this directory we have few properties called npwm export and export this will help us to use the pwm device from user space this npwm gives us the number of pwm channels supported by this chip when we try to do cat npwm it will show the number of channels supported this is a read only property then there is an export property which helps us to export the PWM channel, the default PWM channel which you want to use for CSFS use. By then there is an unexport property. It helps us to unexport the PWM channel from CSFS after its use. Now, uh, when we uh, export a PWM channel, a PWM X directly will be created in the PWM chip directory. So this X will be from zero to NPWM minus one. NPWM is the number of channels supported. So again, this inside PWM X, there will be a number of properties called period. There'll be duty cycle, polarity, enable and capture. This polarity helps us to set the total period of the PWM signal. The value should be nanoseconds and it is a read write property. Then there is duty time cycle. It helps us to set the active time of PWM signals. Again, the value should be nanoseconds and it is a read write property. Then there is a polarity property. It helps us to set the polarity of PWM signal. Either it can be normal or it can be inverse. Again, it's a read write property. Then there is an enable property which helps us to enable or disable the PWM signal. If we write one to the enable, it will enable the PWM signal. If we write zero to the uh, property to disable the PWM signal. Then there is a capture field which uh, helps us to give the details about PWM configuration. Whatever uh, the current configuration of PWM is there, it helps us to get that detail. This capture is again read only uh, property. Uh, the value cannot be written via this. Uh, 
So now we will see how these commands are used from the user space. So to get the number of channels supported, we write cat sys class pwm pwm chip zero in pwm. This and pwm chip zero can be variable. It can be one, two, three. Again, to export the PWM channel, we write equal zero to the sys class PWM PWM chip zero and the export property. Then once the PWM channel is exported, we will get a directly something like that. If the channel is zero, we will get a directly named PWM zero inside PWM chip. So to set the period and duty cycle, we write the values either in the nanoseconds to the period and duty cycle. Also the duty cycle value has to remain less than period otherwise it will generate an error now to set the polarity we either write normal or write inverse to the polarity property by this command and by default the polarity is normal but if you want to change it to inverse we can do that and once we change to inverse after that if you want to have the normal polarity we can change that also one thing to uh, take a note here is like to set the polarity or to set the period and duty cycle the PWM channel should be in the disabled state. We cannot do this in the enabled state. If you try to do that in the enabled state, we will get an error from the Linux kernel. Uh, to enable the PWM timer, we need to write echo one to the enable property inside PWM zero. Uh, it will enable the PWM timer and we can get the output in our output device. And to uh, disable the PWM timer, we write zero to the enable property. And again, after use via the CFS interface, if you want to unexport the PWM channel, we can do it via eco zero sys class PWM PWM chip zero unexport command. Yeah, so we saw the whole PWM subsystem overview. Uh, we saw the it in details the driver implementation, how the driver implementation is done, how there is an interrelation between the structures of the different types of driver implementation. Then we saw the use of PWM device from the user space by the CSF interface. Now we will see the few of the use cases of PWM devices, how those are used in different embedded devices in our industry. So one of its use is in CPUs and GPUs. Uh, the PWM fans are used in the CPU coolers and the GPU coolers. Uh, it uses an integrated circuit to control the speed of a fan as there may be a lot of heavy load CPUs and GPUs working. So it may give, uh, get hot some time. So we may need some kind of fans or coolers to do that. And PWM fans is used in this thing. This PWM fans control when and how much of cooling is needed to the by the CPU and GPU. Moving forward, uh, it's also fine it's used in the brightness of bulb and LED. So PWM is a very common method of dimming LED and bulb lights. Uh, it works on the principle that we rapidly switch on and switch off the uh, PWM signal. So it kind of creates a pulsing effect, uh, which visually uh, uh, make the LED to be appear as very uh, steady dim light. Uh, this steady dim light brightness variation can be adjusted uh, by can be uh, can be like uh, the brightness can be changed by adjusting the percentage of time the light comes, which is uh, done via the adjusting of duty cycle. So if we set a very low <laughs> Duty cycle, the brightness of the light will be very low. And if we set a duty cycle in a higher edge around 70, 80, the brightness will be much. And this same principle is being used by different kinds of LCD backlights or backlights also in our laptops or in our keypad mobile, mobile keypads and all. Also, PWM devices find its use in the switches. Uh, in the control circuits to control the on and off switches, the PWM device can be used. Uh, it's used in controlling the MOSFET in many of the circuits. Uh, PWM device is also used in the telecommunication. So in telecommunication, the usage is based on the pulse width of the PWM device. So we, the, we encode some values in the source and then we decode the values in the destination. So this, how does it work is like we continuously send a clock signal with a fixed pulse width and based on the pulse width received for the PWM signal, we did decode what is the information there. So if the uh, PWM signal pulse width corresponding to the clock pulse width is nil, then the value received is zero. When the pulse width is same, the value received is one. When the pulse width is twice, the value received is two. When it is four times, the value received is four and so on. If it's three times, it will be three. And one more important thing is the 
uh, here the PWM signal is the information as well as the carrier both. So that is one of the thing of or the info, uh, advantage. But yeah, it helps the use of clock PWM clock signal also as a carrier. Also, PWM device is used in the robotics industry. So in robots to control its speed and its movement, motors are used. And these motors are somehow controlled by the PWM device. Uh, it's not like PWM device are used in large scale in the robots. It's a very small scale, but it's a study, uh, like it's a research. There can be research on this, uh, how to use PWM device uh, very much because PWM device is very inexpensive. Another use of PWM device is audio effects and amplification. So there are many soundtracks in the video games uh, which needs amplification or which needs to give the audio effect. So PWM devices found its use here. It's also find its use in the music synthesis. When we see a PWM signal or uh, output of the PWM signal, we will see that it's a difference between two saw suited waves. One of the tau suited waves is inverted. So there will be some high level values and some low level values. So when we do a ratio of high level wave to the low level wave and modulate uh, it with the low frequency oscillator, we will get a sound amplification. And this sound amplification timbral variation can be produced by varying our duty cycle. So if you vary the duty cycle, the amplification timbral variation can be varied. And as I said earlier, the uh, soundtracks of video games uses the PWM device. So the duty cycle range for those PWM devices normally between 12.5% to 50%. Also PWM devices find its use in the inverters. Uh, it is used to control the inverter voltages, which is uh, used in many applications like uh, AC motor and other special motors also. Also the device efficiency or the inverter efficiency depends on the harmonic content of the PWM signal. The, the way the PWM signal is uh, doing the harmonic motion and the what's the harmonic uh, property that affects the uh, inverter efficiency. These are very simple circuit of uh, inverter and how the PWM devices or controller is connected to that device. Yeah, so we have come to the end of the presentation. Uh, uh, we uh, discussed the what is PWM, how the PWM is used. Then we saw the PWM subsystem overview. Then we went into details regarding the PWM driver implementation to understand the in-kernel APIs. We saw both types of driver implementation, the generic framework and the legacy framework also. Uh, legacy framework we saw based on the Samsung PWM driver. Then that we uh, uh, take a, took a look in the uh, using of PWM system with sys SysFS interface, that is from user uh, space. Then after that, we uh, got into the details of each use cases of PWM uh, device. So what we can conclude from this uh, uh, short session was that PWM is a very discrete device. It's a very individual device, which has no fixed purpose and it can be used in many different ways. And uh, whoever is the board designer of a specific embedded device, uh, it depends on him how he want to use the PWM device. And PWM device is very flexible in that nature that it can be used in multiple ways. And that's why PWM device is in nowadays is uh, getting used as an important component in very useful devices like either be it in fan coolers in heavy load CPUs and GPUs, either be it in robo robotics in transformers, in switches, in inverters, uh, in telecommunication industry also. Then it is used in the LED bulbs, in the LCD backlights, in the vibrators of cell phones. And in future, it may find its use in other areas also. One of those areas can be the medical, for medical purpose. As we see, there are a lot of uh, engineering devices being used in the medical purpose. And so maybe PWM device are being currently used or can be used. It's uh, for research purpose, yeah, but we are hopeful that it can be used. Then again, another advantage is of using PWM devices, like one of the basic advantages, it is very inexpensive device. And the one of the most important advantage is the PWM subsystem present in the Linux kernel. So if you are using an uh, OS as Linux kernel in a embedded device, the, there is a already implemented and well-maintained and very flexible PWM subsystem which is there in the Linux kernel. So to use a PWM device efficiently, we can, so this helps us to use the PWM device efficiently. 
so that was the presentation uh, so if you have any questions you can ask and thank you for very much for joining this session so if you have any question you can ask